Well, we have got a fascination with founders in our culture, people who start stuff. Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates. Uh, I've had a new generation of founders here in Fort Knox, Stitch Fix founder Katrina Lake and Guild Education founder Rachel Carlson, to name a couple. This week, we're going to dig into what successful founders do right and what we can all learn from them. Basically, hey, the, the way I look at it, even if you're not starting the next Apple, chances are pretty good that a lot of us have started something or will before too long. Maybe it's a small business, a major project on your job. Welcome to Fort Knox. I'm CNBC's John Fort at the NASDAQ market site overlooking New York's Times Square. My guests, CNBC wealth editor Robert Frank, who has chronicled the ways of successful entrepreneurs for many years now, and the irrepressible Scott Galloway, <laughs> professor at NYU's Stern School of Business, author of New York Times bestseller, The Four, which examines the animating ideas behind Apple, Google, Facebook, and Amazon. And I hear you've got a new podcast that's uh, due out before long. Yeah, thanks for bringing it up. I'm co-hosting with Kara Swisher on the Vox Network, a podcast called Pivot. Although I wanted to call it Stable Genius, but it got overruled. <laughs> that might have been false advertising. Yeah, you think? Okay, so you too. On both counts. I mean, no, just one count. Uh, you're also, you started some stuff. Yeah, started a bunch of companies. And I think we have a tendency to romanticize entrepreneurs. I would argue the majority of entrepreneurs, it's a defense mechanism. I learned early after a stint at Morgan Stanley that I just couldn't thrive and succeed in the corporate world. So for me, entrepreneurship was a defense mechanism. But talking about entrepreneurs, you know, grit, excellence, hold their people accountable. But I think more than anything in an information age, they have got to be great storytellers to attract cheap capital that gives them the ability to make mistakes, get traction. If you look at the people, all the names you talked about, you listen to them speak, and you just want to buy stock. And speaking of storytelling, this week on Fort Knox, for the one-on-one, -on -one, I've also got Maynard Webb. He's a former board chairman at Yahoo, former CEO of Live Ops, chief operating officer at eBay, board member at Visa and Salesforce, and he just wrote a book, Dear Founder, which is structured as advice, just, hey, on all kinds of little issues, from setting up the company to dealing with people to when the board wants to can you. Uh, issues that apparently founders have to deal with, Robert. Now, Robert, you um, are our go-to guy on success, mm -hmm. successful people. You're the wealth editor. You've looked not just at how much money these folks have, but also right. what got them there. So sometimes it seems like overnight success for people. Yeah. Like the, the first yeah. thing they start works. Right. Is that usually the case, or is no, there the, some characteristic the, of stick to Yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of the entrepreneurs I've talked to said, I was an overnight success after 20 years. <laughs> um, and so uh, I would agree with Scott that storytelling is really important, and how to deal with people is important. I have three things that I've discovered are really important, and they are not the usual things that people say, which is hard work, focus, and find your passion. That's what they say. None of those really? are true. As far as I... Are they I, false I, or are they just not the main things? They're not the main things. Okay. So the main things, the first is ignorance, right? Yeah. So the guys who come into a market, and the reason that Jeff Bezos reinvented retailing is because he didn't start out at Macy's. Hmm. The reason that uh, Elon Musk has reinvented cars is because he didn't start at GM. So all these guys tell me the best thing they brought to reinventing their industry and starting a brand new disruptor was they didn't know what couldn't be done in that industry. So ignorance is number one. Yeah. Too stupid to know you're going to fail. Exactly. Yeah. And, and again, not knowing well, but there's that problem. and this. So you really have to rethink an industry, and the best way to do that is to not know anything about it. Hmm. The second thing is just almost an obsessive personality, that, that when you have an idea and you see the vision for that idea, everyone will tell you that it's the wrong idea. Everyone in the beginning will say, that can't work, that won't work, that's stupid. If they tell you the opposite, you know it's not going to be a winning idea. The, because? The, the best ideas, whether it's Fred Smith at FedEx or Elon Musk, because, again, to, to really make it, you have to be the guy that changes an entire industry. Hmm. And so that ability to, you know, uh, Scott mentioned grit, that's part of it. But almost, I mean, these guys are almost obsessive compulsive personalities. When they get onto something, they just can't let it go. To the, to the sacrifice of their health, their families, everything on earth they are going to stick to that idea whether it succeeds or fails. Huh. Um, and, and then, you know, the last thing I think is... Um, I was waiting on the last thing. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I think is just a lot of these people, everything they look at, they, they try to figure out how you could do it differently. So, you know, you sit down with these guys and you'll start talking about, you know, our business. And they'll start saying, well, 
what if you did that? What if you did? So everything, whether it's a coffee cup or whether it's whatever you're doing, they are always looking for a different way to do it or to see it. And th there are just some people that are, are naturally like that. They're like, yeah. how else could you do this? Hmm. Scott Galloway, t tell us the story of Red Envelope, because mm -hmm. I uh, knew of the company before I knew you. Yep. Um, and I, how, how did that come about? I, mean, I take it you never mm -hmm. worked for Hallmark. No, a lot of what you said is true. If, if, if the business made perfect sense when it was started, it would already be there. Someone else would already be doing it. So it was the 90s. I've always thought that uh, you know any success that I've registered has been a function of luck and geography. And I came at professional age in the best zip code in the world, where there was more wealth created within a seven-mile radius of SFO in the 90s than, to that point, all of Europe since World War II. Oh. And I started a consulting firm, was, was consulting to e-commerce and retailers, and got intoxicated with the Internet, had a shaved head, a good rap, could raise a lot of money in, in the 90s, and started an e-commerce company. And it was, I've never had a business plan. I thought, okay, the Internet, I went to a conference with John Doerr, he said the Internet's all about saving time. The only people on the internet at that time was dudes. Right? Dudes save time, gifts, a database that matches people, occasion, with the right gift. Went out, raised about 60 or 80 million dollars, and launched Red Envelope. And I thought there was an opportunity to be, I'm a big fan of benchmarks, to be the more urban, hipper, more, if you will, kind of erotic version of Tiffany. So lower price point, more aggressive, more aggressive sort of urban, uh, I don't want to call it sexual, but provocative advertising and be, be the urban version of the younger version of Tiffany and do it online. And because we chose the Internet as a channel, we could go raise a lot of capital. And so were you right? Uh, for a while. Um, it was a great experience. Some people made some money. But in the end, when the credit crisis hit in 2008, I also think Amazon was out there. The cost of keywords, the cost for bidding on Mother's Day gift when we launched was X. Within eight years, it was 8x because of all the other players with cheaper capital coming in. Ultimately, the company went through a reorganization, was sold to Liberty Media. Um, I, this was one of those companies, a longer story. I think the board screwed up this company. I was, both, I was an angry founder. I was literally the kind of the, the cliche of an angry, destructive founder. Our venture capitalists were um, uh, awful at retail yet vindictive. I mean, it just, it was like, it was the perfect storm of bad things. So no, it didn't, it didn't end well. Well, and, that, and that's another good point. You know, you look at someone like Fred Smith, who was a founder and one of the great operating CEOs. And then you look at Uber and Travis and, you, you know, to Scott's point, he was an angry founder. But the skills of being a founder, which are very eccentric and peculiar and often grading on people, you think of, of, of <laughs> not that you're grading, not that you're that. grading, I'm but, 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 no, no, but, you're, but I think you have all the qualities of, of both uh, an operator and a founder. But, but those qualities often don't translate into being the sort of calm, large scale manager of people yeah. that you then need to do. Yeah. So it's really, I think people underestimate how difficult it is and how rare it is for Mark Zuckerberg, Larry and Sergey and some of these guys at Bezos to to have that sort of incredible vision and energy and disregard for other people. Mm. You have to have a complete disregard for everybody because you know you're right. And then all of a sudden the switch flips and you're suddenly the guy that has to work into these huge teams and manages. So so it's it's really difficult and I think I, I'm surprised often how how common it is for some of these big companies that they did make that transition. Yeah, and you, you mentioned the importance of people. Again, this is uh, Fort Knox. I am John Fort. We're talking about what makes successful founders special, what makes them different, what makes them tick. I talked to Maynard Webb about exactly this question in his book, Dear Founder. Um, what is the thing that so many founders get wrong that he needed to give them advice about? He said, dealing with people. Take a listen. I think people and culture, two things. Everything's about people at the end of the day, no matter how great an idea and how good a strategy you have, you still have to have people to carry it off. And finding the right people right. and motivating and inspiring them is important. Mm -hmm. And then on the culture side, I think you, either, you have a culture whether you know it or not. Scott, did you think about culture much when you were not as a young man and no. it's, it's an interesting thing that I would say the area I've tried to develop most is I think the key to successful leadership in corporate America or really in any environment is empathy and mm -hmm. that is to Maynard's um, point and empathy doesn't mean being nice no it, it means it means putting yourself in the shoes 
So the team of the best players wins. So your ability to get cheap capital and also attract and retain the best employees is central. Greatness is achieved in the agency of others, full stop. And so as a younger man, I thought, everyone must be like me. My goals, and this sounds crass, is I wanted to be ridiculously wealthy and just generally awesome. That, and I thought, that's everyone else's goal. Sounds pretty, is but it not? <laughs> what, what you find is individuals and companies are individuals and they have different priorities. Some are willing to work nights and on weekends but need to be at Little League. Some people want to manage others. Some people want to develop a profile and be in the media a lot. And your ability as a leader to say, I'm going to figure this out, John. I'm going to figure out what's important to you. I'm going to put myself in your shoes. And even if those things aren't important to me, I'm going to work with you to make you win. And having a sense, a real sense of believable empathy for people. I, 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 would, I think that's true often. I'm, I'm amazed having read the Bezos biography and, of course, the Steve Jobs biography before that, how successful they were without without that without that yeah <laughs> and 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 i think you know i mean it's, you read about some of the meetings that bezos has and you know he's he's com very blunt about it. sorry i didn't take my stupid pill today i didn't get what you just said i mean it, it's just shooting people down and yet here he is so so i think and that's know, what i meant by it doesn't mean being nice because at the same time he and amazon have this reputation for caring intensely about what the customer wants yeah that's so right. maybe even if it's not empathy for yeah. the people he's working with that's right he can create this culture around empathy for the customer yeah and maybe that's i'm a great rude point. to you but we both care about really serving that customer and figuring out even through tiny signals what they really care about. Yeah, that's a great point. I think it's right. Less about empathy, more the ability to imagine what the customer wants. And and that's what Bezos has been great. There's another thing, maybe a fourth thing. How often do you sleep? How many hours a night do you sleep? Yeah, I'm not one of these guys that sleeps four hours. Okay, I'm a night person. I sleep kind of one to eight, so I get a solid seven, which is, okay. I mean, you know, I'm I, I'm 85, and it's because I sleep a lot. I mean, look at me, guys. No, I'm not, I'm not one of these people that doesn't need sleep. But need but sleep. it is amazing how many of the founders I talk to, and, and some of it just they there's this urgency of there's not much time in this world. I have so much I plan want to get done. I Didn't mean, Bezos just say he sleeps like seven hours a he, night? He though? does too, and it yeah. was surprising because a lot of the guys I talk to it's just it's three to four hours, and and you just think about. That's an extra three to four hours a day that you can, and, and they function. I don't know how, but, but they do. And you think about over your lifetime how much productivity you can get with the three or four extra hours or a day. Or how many tweets you can send. That yes. Maybe <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Maybe you should exactly. get more sleep. <laughs> more sleep. The only, one of the things I think we've left out of the conversation is the thing that separates entrepreneurs from other people. It's just an incredible endurance or ability to absorb risk hmm. because the difference between a founder and employees is founders write the, sign the front of checks, employees sign the back. Right. And I know a lot of people, they think of themselves as founders, but would never in a million years think about actually taking their own money. This is what you do as an entrepreneur. The first two years, my company L2, I worked pretty much 12 to 14 hours a day, such that every, every January or every beginning of every month, I could write a check for ten dollars to $50,000 the, to the company. So I paid to go to work. Most people would never dream of doing that. Wait, I don't yeah. get paid? Right. So your ability to absorb that risk. You want to be an entrepreneur? Imagine borrowing money from everyone you know, including your parents, your wife's parents, and then losing it all. Congratulations, <laughs> you're an entrepreneur. Robert, uh, there are different ways that different types of founders and entrepreneurs rationalize that risk, yeah. I guess. Mark Zuckerberg grew up uh, upper middle class in... Um, I guess north of New York, his right. dad was a dentist. You know, risk, I guess, meant something different to him. It meant dropping out of Harvard, right. but probably there was a safety net there. Right. Uh, Steve right. Jobs, different profile. Yeah. Um, Katrina Lake, different profile. Uh, how, how much do the circumstances in which uh, an entrepreneur uh, grows up or finds themselves factor into, you think, their appetite for risk? Yeah, less than we think. And I think the, the key to risk, and I agree with Scott, that, that there has to be the sense that everything I have is going into this company and I'm not, I'm not seeking a paycheck immediately. But where, the, where you and I would see risk in, in, the, in a sense of maybe gamblers, where I'm going to take a bet on this, they don't see risk at all. To them, there is no risk because they so clearly see the future of their business and the potential for that market. And sometimes they're wrong. Hmm. We never hear about 
all the failures, the, the, the eight out of 10 failures that mm -hmm. don't become billionaires. But they, to them, it's not a risk because to them, they, they see it so clearly and the execution of that is so cut and dry that it's just a matter of, of getting through the first period where you're profitable and you can start paying people. So I don't see they, they see it as I could lose everything, uh, but I'm just going to, you know, put the, put the ball in the roulette and spin the wheel. But what it's, about the ones who have basically lost everything already? Uh, previously and other ventures that didn't work out, but somehow right. managed to throw their head back in the ring and convince themselves again that this time it's going to work. You notice anything about the psychology of that person who, despite the evidence of their own entrepreneurial ability, what the market says, all that stuff, they still manage to start something that eventually succeeds? Well, and I'm curious, Scott, that one of the ingredients to success that everyone talks about now is failure. You know, if this guy has failed three times, right. he's fantastic because he's learned <laughs> those right. lessons that, that, I mean, do you agree with that? And, and what is it about those people that can, continues to re-up? Or do they, do they say, maybe it's me, maybe I shouldn't be? Yeah, it's a bit of an exaggeration yeah. because I think in America, I don't think, we, they, they say we embrace failure. We don't embrace failure, we tolerate it. Hmm. And I think success in, in your private, in your, in your core professional life, and also in your personal life, is a function of your resilience. Everyone faces failure. Everyone gets fired. Everyone loses people they love. Everyone faces injustice at some point in the corporate world. And your ability to mourn and then move on is a key ingredient to success. I've started nine companies. I think I'm generously three, four, and two. And I've been beamed in the face. The company you talk about, Red Envelope, mm -hmm. I was kicked off the board. Of the, you know, I was kicked out of the band I started. <laughs> It was a really difficult time for me. I learned from it, I moved on, and then I got it back to the plate and, and swung harder. But it's kind of and a badge of honor, right? Once you... It doesn't hurt you. I'd say in the U.S. it doesn't... You don't have a scarlet letter like I would argue have in Europe and other yes, societies where true. if you fail, that's you're true. done. You can recover. Some people claim they like it. It's a bit of a, an exaggeration to say, Americans, we embrace failure as long as it's on the way to success and there's indications you're going to be right, successful. Right, that's true. <laughs> but it's that great graph, and you showed it out. People, this is what people think success looks like. This is what success looks like, right? Scott, how much of it is being able to uh, kind of snatch, in a way, victory from the jaws of defeat or, or create little victories even when overall you didn't cross the finish line that people expected you to cross. You're able to say, okay, well, maybe it didn't work out uh, overall, but I learned this, and I can use this in this way, and this really worked well, and so if I get back out there, and I do this, this, and this, but not that, I can succeed next time. Being able to convince yourself that there was success in there somewhere. So, uh, 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 you know, so many components that go into the soup of success, but one of them with successful companies typically is agility. Google did not start out as a search engine. Very few companies end up finding success where they had initially envisioned. The company I had started, L2, that we just sold to Gartner, was originally going to be an events company. And then we ended up being, you know, benchmarking digital competence. Because you have to be in a position where you face the enemy, you see what happens, and then you, you adjust. You pivot. You pivot, you adjust, <laughs> and you go after you go after where the money is. And everyone says it's a relentless focus, never give up. Sure, give up. If this isn't working, yeah. try something else. Yeah. I mean, and, and there's a balance between that and perseverance. But your ability, uh, I mean, I would argue Facebook's the most agile company in the world. 7% of their revenue on the IPO from mobile. They got it wrong. He did not think that it was going to be an app economy. He was wrong and said, I'm clearly wrong. Boom. And now it's, what is it, 94%? From mobile, so yep. agility. Very few successful businesses started out, uh, ended up where they started out. Robert, um, w when you look at the outside of money and being awesome, the mm -hmm. things that right. animate uh, and, and motivate founders, how much of it is the impact they want to have in the world? Mark Benioff, founder of Salesforce, has just bought Time Magazine. Right. Uh, he built in the structure into Salesforce at its founding, where a certain percentage uh, of of their profit was going to end up going to um, to charity. How how common is well that mindset? There, there's the rhetoric, which is everyone says they're not doing it for the money, right? right? Everyone's yeah. Silicon Valley. We are doing it. To there's that great line from the Silicon Valley, the TV show, where the Sergey Brin character says, "I don't want to live in a world where another company is changing the world." <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Which is which is really that's the honest truth. And so so it let let's. 
get back to basics, it really is about money because I money agree. is the measure. I agree. Um, not maybe not the measure, but but certainly one of the top two. It's easier to so, change the world when you got a bunch when you of got money. a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the myths that you brought up. Uh, there is no shortage of people, of billionaires, that come to NYU Stern to speak with students, and they typically end with follow your passion, yeah. which I think is total BS, because it's typically a guy who made his money starting a software as a service application for healthcare maintenance. <laughs> and it's, okay, that was your passion. At five years old, that's what I wanted to do. And I always remind people, anyone who tells you to follow your passion is already rich. <laughs> Find something you're good at, and then the accoutrements of becoming great at it will make you passionate about whatever it is. And anybody who says it's not about the money is usually already right. rich as well. That's right. um, so, so I do think I do think money is a big motivator. Um, not so much for the money's sake, but for for the things it allows you, the impact it allows you to have. And then I think, and then I think after that, um, it's it's not so much making the world a better place, but it's it's some kind of definable impact that will outlive you. Um, you know, Steve Jobs said, "I want to to create a company that will." continue to exist and grow far beyond my lifetime. And I think he's done that to a degree where even he couldn't have imagined. Um, so, so I think it's just that, that long, longing for eternal life of some kind, whether it's through a company, a brand, um, you know, a great piece of art for artists, but, but the corporate equivalent of that, something that will live on and be admired for, for hundreds of years. That's a great note to close this portion of the conversation. Uh, Robert, Scott, thanks. Um, from here, Maynard Webb. He wrote the book, Dear Founder. He is the Fort Knox one-on-one -on -one this week. Uh, as the podcast continues, you can catch that. This has been Fort Knox from here at the NASDAQ Market Square and Market Site overlooking Times Square. I'm John Fort. See you next time.